your entire data uh, in your way. Uh, but this talk was actually made before I joined Enquos. Um, and it talks about how you can uh, turbo boost your Python development with some cloud services uh, where you do not store medical data about your <laughs> clients. So less uh, security, security critical um, applications that you can use internally in your team or just uh, like site hobby projects. Um, so let's start. Um, development time on like this site projects or, or any development time is very limited. Um, when you take into account, account uh, communication with your customers, um, staying on top of new tools, researching, um, trying out new tools, uh, new, new, new uh, approaches, um, at the end of the day, you really only get to code about a few hours. And um, I really like to make those few hours count as much as possible. So uh, to increase the development time, so to have more hours of coding per day, uh, I like to automate routine tasks so I don't do manual stuff that is not that should not be manual um, and I want to spend less time discovering uh, what went wrong when something goes wrong so basically you focus on on what brings one brings value so if you're a Plone developer I think you should focus on developing Plone and not uh, host your own Redmine instance and host your own email yes if you're a big company and if, if you have a, a team of uh, administrators yes but like if you're a small small Python shop like do Python and they let other people take care of other stuff. Uh, they're good at it and uh, you're good at Python, do Python. Mm. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, the services that, that, that I use personally to keep unnecessary work out, out of the way so I, I can focus on, on being productive. Uh, starting with a problem, it can be either a bug report or uh, a feature request or an idea that something needs to be done. Um, all the development, uh, myself and like in teams that I work with, we keep in feature branches and Git. So all the development happens outside of master. Um, and when the implementation is ready, the developer issues a pull request and the code in that pull request uh, gets tested with, uh, with, with uh, Travis. And uh, if something goes wrong, uh, if the code coverage goes, uh, goes down, or if there's, there's anything, anything wrong, uh, the developer will get a feedback on the pull request and uh, he, he or she can then fix it and then you will get more feedback and more feedback and more feedback. And um, once the pull request is ready, so all the tests uh, are a go, uh, the coverage is good, documentation is there, uh, we merge it into master. And at that point, um, this triggers another, another build on, on Travis, this one on the master branch. And um, it's rare, but it also happens that once you merge into master, Travis, the bill in Travis would fail, but this is very rare. And that, in that uh, cases, I do manual intervention to see what went wrong. But most of the cases, the build on the master will, uh, will pass because it passed in the pull request. And uh, at that point, I immediately deploy, deploy. Like, no manual intervention, directly deploy from master. Uh, there is risk that you will break stuff. Like, normally, you would have uh, you, you would like gather a, a, lot of, a lot of changes and then you do a release and you would uh, push your release to staging and then you, have, you would have your QA team go through that and then you push that to production. Um, and I, I found out that a lot of changes are only to CSS and templating and not critical stuff and if you're not changing the database there is not so much risk of actually having big problems when you deploy. Because if you only change a template, the, 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 the database stays the same, you can easily revert back. Um, and also, I like to keep moving forward. So if you, if you did deploy a, a change that breaks a template, uh, don't revert, just do another deploy that fixes uh, whatever you introduced. Um, and like, the benefits of having uh, your changes being deployed immediately are far outweigh the drawbacks that, that you can get. Uh, developers are much more motivated because their code is actually being used immediately. Uh, and also, um, I found out that uh, they care more about not breaking stuff because if you're just doing something and you know like two or three weeks after, somebody's gonna do a release and then check and then put it into uh, staging and you're like, yeah, somebody else will look at it and it's gonna be cool. But if you do a pull request and you know that that pull request, when it gets merged, it gets directly to the production and to the customers, uh, Developers are more like, oh, I need to really care what I'm doing. Um, and lastly, 
if if you're in if if you're in like customer support and you receive a bug bug report something doesn't work, it's a huge difference between answering yes, thank you, we noted that done, and we will probably fix it in the next release coming in the, the following month, or waiting one hour, seeing if you can fix it quickly, and responding, hey, it's fixed, can you try again? A huge difference for the customer. Um, yeah, so when the code runs in production, there can be errors. Uh, we catch them with Sentry, I'm gonna talk about it later. Um, some of the errors we, we catch with uh, like weekly or bi-weekly or monthly QA runs through the applications, just to the, through, through the apps, so just to catch any errors that we don't catch with testing and that the users don't catch also. Um, and then finally, there are some errors that do, there are some problems that do not occur as errors, but uh, as strange timeouts, or um, there are some restarts without tracebacks, or really odd slow responses. And uh, to catch those, we constantly monitor, I constantly monitor all of this, uh, apps with uh, Datadoc, which I'm going to talk about later, and uh, I aggregate all logs with paper trail. Mm. And also, like if you're doing uh, performance optimizations, you have to measure first before you do changes, because for, like it, for performance, you have to have the measurement. So when you change stuff, you know if it, like if the performance went up or down. Um, so to, to get the formalities out of the way, I use Git, um, and uh, because of GitHub. GitHub for me has a really good UI and I really love the ecosystem built around GitHub, all the services that uh, are integrated into GitHub, which we're going to come to later. Um, starting with continuous integration, uh, continuous integration tells you to run your tests often, uh, preferably on every commit and in a clean environment. And like clean environment, I, I, like, I really like to stress clean environment uh, because a lot of projects I work with, we, we work with students who are not many m much experienced and we get a lot of like a fluctuation between uh, developers on the project and we have new developers coming in every time and two years ago before I started using Travis it, ha it has happened a lot that somebody say like your build out is broken I cannot get this project up and then I would go in and debug for like two or three hours only to find out that that person's Python is broken or something like that now if it works on my machine and if it works on Travis where it's built every time on a clean Ubuntu instance if it works on both of us, then it's probably your fault and not I don't have to debug that. So like, get a clean Ubuntu and start from there. Um, so yeah, Travis. Uh, Travis uh, is a is fun uh, continuous integration service for your Python packages. Uh, it's a hosted continuous integration service, so as like having Jenkins but hosted, and it's free for all, all open source projects, but also available for your private projects. You can pay them and they run your, your tests. Um, so it's like having Jenkins really well integrated into GitHub. Uh, when you go to the Travis website, you uh, see a bunch of, 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 of builds and you can click through them and see the logs. Um, so this is if you select one, uh, one of the build and then the, how, how it looks, uh, how, how the logs, logs look. Like I said, Travis is free for any GitHub repository, so you have to have your code on GitHub. Travis only works with GitHub, sadly. Uh, they say that they will work on that. Um, they support also private repos. And they already ran, ran like a gazillion builds for a very, very uh, huge amount of open source projects. So like they are here to stay. Um, they support just, just about anything. Um, you have pre-installed uh, databases. Um, basically, how, how you start, you just sign up and you add .travis.yaml file with a few lines uh, like this uh, to your repository and then that's it. Whenever you're gonna push code to, to GitHub, Travis will um, run your tests. Uh, you have a lot of control over what Travis does. You can do like before install, do stuff, and then after you, you, you can upload some stuff. Uh, like I said, a lot of uh, pre-installed services are, are, are uh, available. You can also do headless testing with robot. So you can, you can actually spin up uh, a headless Firefox on Travis and run your uh, acceptance test against a, an actual browser and have uh, happy, happy robot time. Uh, you can whitelist and blacklist branches. So um, for example, if you have an like a experimental branch and you don't, you don't want that to be tested on Travis because then you would get uh, build failures reports, you can disable it. Um, 
and there are a ton of build notifications, either on IRC email or whatever. By default, Travers will send an email to the committer. So this is, again, really cool when you have a bunch of developers on a project, like part-time or like hobby developers, because they only go in like once per week or once per month, and then if they break something, they get an email, hey, you broke something, please go fix it, because others are then going to have a broken environment. Mm. Status images are really cool because you can use them in your uh, documentation and you can brag uh, around. Uh, you, you can even have, like, in, in your company, you could have a big screen with all, your bill, with, all, with all your repositories and then the status image next to it. And this is how you also promote among, among your team, uh, you know, building continuously, uh, having a good quality of your code. Um, this, they are really well integrated with GitHub. Whenever you do a pull request with a Travis-enabled uh, repository, you, you would have this um, another bar under your build-out that will say if this pull request uh, is good to merge or if the, the build is still running or there was an error. So like if Plone API uses this, every pull request that gets merged first needs to have uh, a green bar from Travis, otherwise I will not merge it because there could be something wrong and you should fix that first. Um, moving on to, to deployment. So when Travis on master uh, passes for Pyramid, we go directly to Heroku, which is a cloud application platform and uh, it works really well with Pyramid uh, and um, Postgres as well. And uh, basically the platform as, a, platform as a service provider, they give you a Python runtime uh, you don't have OS level access, you just, you just, you just uh, push code to their Git repository and then every time you push new code, they will basically uh, install it and then start running it. And again, out of the box, they support a ton of services that you can hook into your, into your application. And this is how you enable continuous uh, delivery with Travis. So you just tell, it, tell Travis to deploy to Heroku and um, tell it your, your, your app and your API key. Uh, this, this token can be also encrypted. It does not have to be in plain text. Travis has a way of you, of you encrypting uh, secret uh, strings. So they're not in your repository. I mean, the clear text is not in your, in your repository. Um, and then when the build is successful, uh, uh, Travis will, 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 will push your latest code to Heroku and they will deploy it. So. Uh, from, you know, from an initial problem to a pull request with implementation, with a single click, just merge, you get that code in production. And that, for me, has proven to be really, really valuable. With Plone, however, you cannot run on Heroku. Uh, that's why uh, I have like a script like this normally. Like for, for Plone, it's a bit more manual work to set this continuous delivery up. But once you have it up, it still runs well. Uh, so this will... Uh, there's a, there's a pyramid app called GitHook that you install on the server and this will listen for uh, push notifications from, from, from GitHub and then that script checks for Travis and then runs uh, a local fabric command that reruns build out and restarts all the servers. And this also works. I haven't had any major problems with this. Um, okay, I'm fine with my time. So now we're in production, uh, code is running, there are errors. I used to use, for Plone, I used to use a mailing logger, which will, would send emails to your email. And that kind of uh, like clumps your, clumps your inbox because when, em when errors start to appear, they normally come in huge groups. So you would get like tens or hundreds of email into your inbox. Uh, and then I learned about Sentry, which is, uh, again, another uh, software as a service provider, this one for uh, catching, er and catching errors and reporting on them. And for example, like this is one of the, oh yeah, it's really washed out. Um, so in this case, I got, that there, there were 51 errors and uh, with the mailing logger, I would get 51 emails with little context. Um, but with Sentry, I, got, I, I think I got just one and two emails saying like there's an aggregate of many, many, many errors. You should go check them out. Mm. And uh, for every error, you get a trace back. And on every line, you can click and you can get context, like every, all the variables that are set in, those, in, that, like in that line, uh, you can see them. And for debugging, this is just really, really awesome. Because like, if you get a plain text, uh, plain text traceback, you know 
where in the code the, the error occurred, but you don't know the variables and the state of the code. With this, you know, like, you're like 95% there. Um, and this has sped up uh, troubleshooting a lot. Um, it's not moving anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Where are we now? Yeah, software. Um, so I'm just going to talk and the slides are going to come up. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is how you set up a Sentry for your Plone instance, and they have a really good integration to Pyramid and any other Python web framework. Um, going to the problems that, occur, that do not occur as errors. Uh, I use Datadoc. So Datadoc is a, it's like, it's a cloud-based service that, that like, brings to one convenient place your, your, your system uh, metrics, your application metrics, uh, your uh, hosting providers metrics, so all, all that other stuff, and also alerts from your monitoring systems for, from Pingdom or, or stuff like that. Uh, and also events from source repositories, from issue trackers, so you have all that data in one place. Uh, the good thing about all of the services that, that I just described is they are, described, they are either open source or based on open source tools. So, so Datadoc, for example, is uh, based on StatsD, so in any point of time in the future you need to start taking really good care about security in your project, you, you can re replace most of these services by installing open source software on your own servers. Um, and Datadog is kind of like having Munin and Operations Twitter in one place. Uh, the thing is that you have events which are like uh, commits and and outages and what whatnot, and then you have graphs with your with your with your measurements and with your data. And the thing is that the graphs have. Uh, the, the graph, when you go over the graph, they're like synchronized. You have like, you see in one graph, if you go over there, the, the, there will be a line on, the other, on the, all of the other graphs. So you see, you can correlate. And also the graphs will have uh, markers where the events occurred. So if, if, there's a, if there's a spike and you just hover it and you see, aha, uh -huh, there was a new, new commit at that point and maybe that caused that, uh, that spike. So it's really, really cool. Uh, and again, out of the box, they support a ton of stuff. You just install it and then you click through it and um, you need to install their agent on your server, which could be uh, like for security, for security, like high security projects, which could be a problem, uh, but for most of projects, it's still uh, acceptable. The third thing that I really like about Datadoc and why I started using them is uh, custom metrics. Uh, they give you a Python library that you install and import, and then you can. Uh, gather various application metrics, like uh, how many users are active, or like uh, you, you can do histograms with uh, of, of, of uh, you know, rendering times, or, or query times, or database access times. And they generate really nice graphs uh, for you. Uh, not visible here. <laughs> uh, and then finally, when you're when you're in when you're in Datadoc and you see you, you, you're going to see a spike or something strange, you would want more context. Um, and originally, I, I, I logged into the server and, for example, if I had eight zopes, I would have to grab grab through all of the logs and it's kind of clunky. So I started using Paper Trail, which aggregates all your all your logs across many 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 systems, uh, and then they give you a really really nice um, interface to search through them. So for example, here I just search for article and I would get like all the occurrences when an article was downloaded in Plone. Um, and you can, you can also like export this into various, various uh, formats and you can do then data mining, like for example, uh, which user downloaded the most articles like in this case. Mm. Yeah, and a bonus slide. Uh, this is a thing I want to add to Plone API this week. Uh, Coverals.io, they are they host your coverage data. Another another service provider. Um, in essence, you run your tests locally, 
your coverage uh, test, you generate your coverage report and then upload the, the XML to them and then they will uh, make it, they will display it in nice HTML and also they will notify you if your test coverage goes down, which is again really cool for uh, for open source or, or, or side, side projects where you have different uh, contributors coming in and in a pull request you see if the, if, like, even, even if Travis built passed, but if the test coverage went down, you say, can you please add more tests? So you have the trend of always having the test coverage increase. Uh, and like, using Travis and coveralls uh, already in pull requests like, really brings several, several uh, um, advantages to your project. Uh, starting, you eliminate technical debt because you see that you're not introducing code that does not have tests. Um, you can discover trends. For example, if uh, like if if you're running your tests and your and your um, your your code coverage only locally from time to time, you not really know where you are. But if if you upload it on every uh, on every build, you can see like how it was, and you can also they also do per developer tracking. So you, they they also tell like which of the developers is bad. So that you can you should kick them to like do more tests. It's really nice. And uh, of course, you can, uh, uh, you can brag. Um, and again, we're having connection problems. You can brag to other, uh, uh, other companies. Like if you, if you have an open source, whoa. Let's see. Where's my mouse? An unexpected error has occurred. Please quit Keynote. <laughs> Quit keynote, start again. It doesn't want to quit. <laughs> and where was we? Is it there? Cool. Yeah. Um, you, again, coveralls like Travis gives you status badges with which, you, like, if you have a, a, a open source products, you can brag about how they, how, how cool they are uh, because they're they have a really high test coverage. But also inside your team, um, like, if there's just like a small part of the team that cares about coverage, you can have then have this uh, this status badges somewhere in your office and then promote uh, good test coverage among your among your team in in that way. And of course, you squash out bugs before uh, they, they 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 start running around your code. Uh, so this is the entire loop now coming together, and um, you, you see the uh, continuous delivery being pictured right uh, right there. Yeah, changing the and here we go, zero downtime. <laughs> yeah, um, there's more. Uh, in, in order for you to not reinvent the wheel, I actually made a, 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 a project uh, skeleton that uses all of this and you just run one command and you get a pyramid project with all of this enabled. Um, by the way, this is a logo of a really cool bar in Ljubljana, if you ever visit Ljubljana, which is my city. Um, yeah, I, I, I provide a plone template which has most of the stuff like everything except the continuous delivery because this is specific to your server and you have to do it yourself. But like if, if you use uh, bobtemplates.intel app, you get a Plone project with a lot of uh, Plone best practices already enabled. Um, but if you use the pyramid template, you can actually generate a, a project and then follow the documentation in that project on how to uh, set up Heroku and Travis and whatever. And then on every every uh, commit or every push to master, that code will actually get deployed uh, to to uh, to Heroku, and you can access it uh, publicly. Um, so, if anybody is interested, please try it out. And I want to I want to make this a general general package, so without the um, any my specific decisions and any my specific code or strings in there, rename it to something else and like make it usable for the general public. Um, and that will be it. Questions, please. Yeah. Did you say you were running Plone on Heroku? 
No. Um, Rackspace Cloud, Amazon, uh, AWS, and Virpus, which is not a cloud but a cheap, cheap uh, VPS, which I would not recommend. <laughs> yeah. Do you use Travis for private Yeah. So the question was if I use Travis for private repositories. Yes. So you yes. Uh, the they're not cheap. There are $125 for, the, for two concurrent builds, but you get unlimited repositories, unlimited users, whatever. And it pays off. It pays off a lot. Only because, like I said, when there are new developers coming in, I know that my environment uh, it can be built and can be run, and I don't have to deal, I don't have to do two, three, five hours setting up everybody's machine. Like, this is how Travis does it on clean Ubuntu. Like take care, take care of it on your own from that point on. Yeah. Why not Jenkins? Why not Jenkins? Like I said, because I like to uh, focus on developing and not hosting. If I have to, if if I have to lose two hours every three months to do some Jenkins upgrade or anything. I rather pay Travis a hundred dollars for that, and also the integration with GitHub is really good, like pull request testing and stuff. Yeah, I mean for 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 customer projects where security is an issue, Jenkins definitely, not 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 Travis. Travis is only for my you know, side projects, hobby projects, stuff like that. Depending on the project, but most of the projects I, you cannot use a service like Travis because you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Mostly not because, uh, like I said, I don't do hosting and like they do their own hosting and yeah, yeah. so. Normally, the the well-paid projects take uh, are really, really um, um, they really take good care about security, and they would not like to use services like this yet. Maybe. Are there uh, self-hosted versions of uh, yeah. Paper trail and what was the other one? Datadoc. Datadoc. So, uh, a, an open-source self-hosted alternative to Datadoc is Graphite. And it's, it's based on StatsD, and you have a, a whole ecosystem around it. You can host it yourself. It has, and then basically you need, you need to have gra graphite for the, for the metrics, and then some, I don't know, Twitter clone, clone to, you know, to have the event stream. Yes, you can do it. Sentry is also open source. You can just download and install it yourself. Uh, Paper Trail is basically um, a remote syslog plus Hadoop for searching. So, it's all based on open source tools, so yes, you can do this on your own servers, definitely. You, but you just need to invest time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but my question was, um, other services like, say, Spark, do did, did you search around you know, multiple different options for the ones that you pick for? That you uh, it's mostly based on recommendation I hear from people on conferences. Just, yeah. And then uh, I do a bit of research and decide. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thanks.